Yo, yo, yo. Let me know if everyone can hear me here. I'm just trying to double check that all comments could be seen on my and on my computer. I've been having issues with that. So if you're on here, go ahead and let me know that you're here. Just type anything you want. Let me know where you're from. We are going to be doing some related rates today, so that's going to be pretty exciting. I'm going to try typing something over here. Guys, I'm just double checking that everything's working on my end. <laughs> Rusty, that is so funny. Oh my gosh, I'm always thinking about you guys. That's so cool. Well, welcome back. What's going on, math nerds? Hope you're having a fabulous afternoon, evening, morning from wherever you're tuning in. My name's Miguel, also known as the Vegan Math Guy, and today is going to be Math Survival Skill Thursday. It is actually, the sun's out today. We're in Washington. I know a lot of people are getting a storm out in the, the West Coast. Not for us, at least not right now. Anyway, if you're on here, please let me know where you're from. I would love to hear where everyone is tuning in from. And to think that right now there's only 14 of us, but I mean, think about it. We're here trying to learn some math skills together from all over the world, nationwide. Central Florida, that's awesome, dude. Hope the weather is treating you nice. So anyway, as I mentioned, we are going to do some related rates today. Thursday is typically where we cover some math survival skill. And I think I've been getting a lot of comments on Discord and then just comments in general on my TikTok and Instagram just about uh, related rates. So I think that's a very important topic that we should review. Hopefully, you guys can see that on the screen. I, you know, I could do SAT math, but there's so many creators out there that are doing that. Saudi Arabia, shout out. You know, with SAT, I could do that. But again, there's so many other people that do it. Uh, one of my favorites is Math Wizard. She's great. She's always on there. I mean, she logs on like almost every day. So definitely give her a shout out. SAT math, maybe, you know, maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, Tomorrow's live is typically off trail so we can do whatever people like. I can maybe just start doing the uh, SAT stuff. And then if everyone's bored, then we'll just do, you know, some calculus or some higher level math. Okay, I'll think about it, Loxy. So typically it's around this time. So I'm in Pacific time. And when we cover these, they are recorded. So I do post them on my YouTube. <laughs> natural log of seven. That's just natural log of seven. Uh, have I covered limits? I don't think I have on live, but I do have a video that's a kind of elementary. You can go on my YouTube channel talking about limits and there are like some examples and I think there's a PDF on the link that you can download. So give that a try. Uh, but anyway, guys, today, Math Survival Skill Thursday, we are going to be doing some related rates. So related rates is now where we're going to go ahead and create a scenario uh, given the situation. In this case, uh, if you're reading it, it's talking about a stone being dropped in a pond and it's creating these circular little shapes, little ripples. And I'm sure you've all seen that, whether you're on the lake or you're out hiking, you throw a little rock in there and it creates these little ripples. So that's kind of nice. So I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, just every time we do the related rates, we're going to go ahead and create a scenario for this. And this is just going to be a circle because that's exactly what they're talking about. So we have a circle that looks like this. And obviously in a circle, we have the radius. And they're saying that the radius is moving at a constant rate of four feet per second. That means that the radius, dr dt, this is the variable that we're going to give it, is four feet per second. I'm going to try to be as cautious as I can I know I put four feet. I'm American. I'm sorry, but it could be four meters. It could be anything. And now they're trying to say after 12 seconds, how rapidly is the area in, in closed by the ripple increasing? Okay. So we're going to talk about that. So we're trying to find how fast is the area changing? So there's a couple of things we want to find DA over DT because that is how fast the area is changing. That is a rate after 12 seconds. So we'll talk about how we're going to set that up. Just grabbing some coffee here. Okay, so once you draw your diagram, I think it's going to be really helpful for us. We found the DRDT that's given to us. They want us to find DADT. They want us to find the rate of change of the area. So we need to create an equation that represents the area and the radius. So in the comments, who can let me know what equation we could use that represents the circle with the radius and the area?
Yeah, it takes so long. I'm here for a full hour. Okay. So nobody in the comments is telling me, but guys, this is just an area of a circle. Let me go ahead and create this or write this down. Area is equal to pi r squared. So with related rates, you have to go ahead. Thank you, Mac. Thank you, Mac. Pi r squared is going to be the equation that we're going to use. Let me go ahead and just kind of change that a little bit. And now I'm going to go ahead and take the derivative. Now, we're going to take the derivative of each side. And keep in mind, this is technically implicit differentiation. So when I take the derivative of the right side, well, let's do the left side first. The derivative of the left side, that's just a. That's going to be 1, but then implicit differentiation tells us that we have to include a dA over dt to that. So that's why I have dA over dt. And then now on the right side, look how I'm going to write the inter or the derivative here. This is going to become 2 pi r dr dt. All I did was implement the power rule. I brought the 2 down, multiplied it by the pi, and I subtracted 1 by the power. But every time, because this is implicit differentiation, you have to include the dr over dt. Now, this is great. So now let's go ahead and talk about the things we do know. dA dt, we're actually trying to find. So I'm going to leave that there. 2 pi, we don't know the radius, but that's okay. We're going to talk about that in a second. But we know dr dt because we know that the radius is changing at 4 feet per second. So that's going to be 4. So now the only thing that we need to find is r. So let's look at the problem again. We need to find the radius at 12 seconds. Well, if the radius is changing at 4 feet per second, then in 1 second, it's 4 feet. In 2 seconds, it's 8 feet. In 3 seconds, it's uh, 12 feet, and so on. So in 12 seconds, it's going to be 48 feet. That's just, you know, I don't think that's going to make sense in terms of like a, a ripple on a lake, but that's just uh, what that's going to be. So again, every second is changing 4 feet. So in 1 second, 2 seconds, 3 seconds, you can kind of do the math there, and that's going to be 48. So that's my DRDT. So now I'm going to go ahead and write... 2 pi, 48 times 4, and now I'm going to go ahead and multiply these out. 48 times 4 times 2, now it's going to be 384 pi feet squared per second. So that means that the area is changing at that rate. That's the idea of related rates. This is actually pretty cool in my opinion. This is an easy one. We kind of started... I would say semi-easy. All you have to know is the relationship of the area. So we're going to go on to the next problem. Let me go ahead and erase this. And again, if you feel like I'm going too fast or too slow, I do post a replay on YouTube, and you can just slow it down or speed it up if you like. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next problem here. Ah, pretty nice. I set this up so I don't even have to write anything. I don't have to do any work. It's already written for me. Johnny, this is Calc 1. All right, guys, let's go ahead and look at that problem there. We have a softball diamond, and it's a, it's a square whose sides are 60 feet long. And we have a player that's running from first to second base, and it has a speed of 25 feet per second at the instant when she is 10 feet from the base. What is the rate that the player's distance from home plate is changing at that instant? Yo, this is pretty cool. This is actually a problem that for whatever reason, when I was in high school, I was stressing over it for like the entire night. And it's actually pretty simple. I don't know why I was so stressed about it. But let's go ahead and set this up, all right? First, I'm just going to draw a beautiful baseball diamond or softball diamond, whatever. It's both the same thing. I think they're the same size. So we have first base here, and we're really just worried about second base. And let's see, the baseball player, the softball player here is running from first to second. And so there's somewhere in between here. Maybe not so much in between, but there's somewhere. Okay? And this creates a 90 degree angle. And they're saying that the sides are 60 feet. So the, I know that this is 60 because from home to first, it's just going to be 60 feet. We don't know what this value is. Let's just call that x. But we do know that that rate, dx dt, is equal to 25 feet per second because that's how fast the baseball or the softball player is moving. Yes, this is Calc 1. That's awesome. I'm glad you're learning it. Yes, a lot of people are learning this, and I think it's just been uh, something that has been uh, requested a lot. So Thursdays are always math survival skills. We're just going to practice whatever I feel that a lot of people need to do. So here's the thing. It's not 50. It is going to be 50 feet. We'll talk about that. But this is the rate at which it is changing. 
So, Rusty, you are correct. We are going to talk about that. But notice that that 25 is the DX DT. So that is the rate at which the X is changing. So now we need to create, um, they want us to find the rate of the distance from home plate to the player. So we need to create a variable Y here. That's basically the hypotenuse. So now we need to create an equation. Which one, uh, what's the equation that represents the Y, the X, and the 60? If you look at this very carefully, it's just a right triangle. So it's just gonna be Pythagorean theorem. This is just gonna be 60 squared plus X squared is equal to y squared. And now because we're doing related rates, we're gonna go ahead and just take the derivative of this. For the left side, 60 squared is just zero. And then we have plus two x, but then I also have to include the dx dt is equal to two y dy dt. So let's figure out the stuff that we do know. We don't know x yet, the Rusty in the comments already is already telling us what it's going to be. We know dx is just going to be 25 equal to we 2 times y. We don't know what y is, but we'll figure that out in a second. And dy dt is actually what we're trying to find because we're trying to find the rate at which the distance from home plate to the player is changing. Johnny, thank you. Uh huh. So we can isolate y and that's exact, uh, isolate dy dt. But let's go ahead and now find the x and the y. Well, let's talk about uh, the problem or how we're going to find x. I'm going to highlight this. They're saying at the instant when she is 10 feet from second base. So if I draw that, if the player is 10 feet, I kind of put that there, 10 feet from second base, then the x value is going to be 50. This is going to be 50. And that's what Rusty was saying. And now what we can do is we can use Pythagorean theorem to solve for y. So if I kind of draw this triangle off to the side, this was 50, this was 60. We can go ahead and solve for y by using Pythagorean theorem. 50 squared plus 60 squared is equal to y squared. And I'm actually going to punch this into a calculator program that I have that just gives me the answer right away, which is really nice. So 50, 60, I don't know what that is. Okay, so it's the square root of 6,100. So it's like y is equal to 78.1. So now we found y. So x was 50, y was 78.1. We're gonna go ahead and plug those things in. So two times 50 times 25 is equal to two times 78.1 dy dt. And now all we have to do is find dy dt by dividing the 2 times 78.1 to the other side. So we're going to get that dy dt is equal to 2 times 50 times 25 all over 2 times 78.1. And we're just going to simplify that. The 2's cancel out, which is really nice. But of course, we can just get a calculator for this. So this is 16.005 feet per second. So what we're getting here, what we're trying to understand is that when the baseball player or the softball player, I'm sorry, is 10 feet away from second base, the distance from home plate to that player is changing at 16.005. This is the idea of calculus. We're trying to find the instantaneous rate of change. Emmanuel, what's your uh, calc exam on tomorrow? REI, is that really your username? Do you realize... Oh, it's Trey Ray. Oh, if your if your username was REI, you have no idea how much that's worth. Derivatives, nice. So this is kind of like a derivative, but you know, just make sure when you're taking derivatives, you're finding the slope of the tangent line, the instantaneous rate of change, find the slope at a specific uh, time or a specific x value. All right, that was this problem with the baseball diamond. Let me go ahead and erase this. And we're going to go to the next one. As I go to the next problem and everyone's kind of reading it, go ahead and tap, double tap on that screen. Not just tap on it, double tap. And I'm curious, uh, someone already told me where they're from, but where are is, where is everyone else tuning in from? Where are we listening to this live from? Arizona, nice. Hope the weather is pretty nice out there. Arizona, Sedona is beautiful. Spain, España. Idaho, nice. Okay. 
the potato state. I hear that that's that is true, and I didn't believe it when I visited, but it's it has to do something with their soil. So Idaho does in fact have the potato state. Ha, the couch. Yep, your wife is right. Alabama. Okay, nice. Wow. Guys, think about it. We're in all different areas. I'm in Washington. We have Arizona. We have Florida. We have España. We have Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have Idaho. I mean, we're in all different areas of the country, of the world, and we're all sitting here together learning about related rates. All right, let's go to this problem. It looks like a water tank is built in the shape of a circular cone with the height of five meters and the diameter of six meters at the top. Water is being poured into the tank at a rate of 1.6 meters few per minute. And now we want to find the rate of the water level uh, when the water is two meters deep. So always create your diagram here. It looks like in a, it's a circular cone. So I'm going to draw it like this. So we have a circular cone here, and it has a height of 5 meters. So we know the height's going to be 5. Uh, it has a diameter of 6. Ooh, I like this problem. You're going to see why. So the diameter is 6, but I'm just going to put the radius. Is, uh, actually, I'll do the whole thing. This is 6. The radius is 3, technically, on the top. And then water is being poured into the tank. So that means that the volume, dVdt, is 1.6 meters cubed per minute because that is the amount that the water is being poured into this. I like problems with trigonometry too. Nice. I'm glad you did this in class. That's good. All right, so let's see. I set up the scenario for us. I kind of drew it out. We know that the volume is changing at one point, or the volume is increasing at 1.6 meters cubed per minute. And now we want to find the rate at which the water level is rising. So what they want us to find is dh dt when h is equal to 2. I love these problems. You're going to see why. Okay? So let's go ahead and just give ourselves some variables. I have r and then I have h. And we need to remember the equation for the volume of a cone. Who can tell me what that is? In the comments, go ahead and let me know the volume of a cone. Oh, we got Dr. Dre in the chat, and that's awesome. No, don't draw pre-calculus and trig. Johnny, I wish. Right now, you know, I'm really focused on the calculus stuff, but maybe later on. I do know some real analysis, but, you know, you should try to follow. There's, like, Math and Cobb. There's uh, Alvaro, and I think it's a... Uh, uh, there's another account that's that's really good, and he does a great job with math analysis, group theory, ring theory. Ah, here we go. So pi radius squared h over 3. Cinnamon, you are correct. Uh-huh, Dr. Dre. Something divided by 2. Ah, it's divided by 3. So volume is one-third pi r squared h. Now, before we even start, this is where you have to be very careful, okay? Because we are going to take the derivative, but look at our equation. We have the variable v. When we take the derivative of that, we are going to include the dv dt. But look at the right side. We have an r and we have an h. When we take the derivative, we're going to have a dr dt and we're going to have a dh dt. But we know nothing about dr dt. They didn't tell us that, anything at all. So we need to go ahead and find dh dt. Tanner, take calc. Just do it. No questions asked. So again, we don't know anything about dr dt. All we know is dh dt because that's what they want us to find. So where problems like this, you got to be ready to just create some sort of uh, proportion. Here's what I mean by that. We know the diameter is six, meaning the radius is three, and we know the height is gonna be five. So we can go ahead and create this. Three over five is equal to the radius over h. This is gonna prove very, very helpful. If I multiply the h to the other side, I get that three-fifths h is equal to r. You're gonna see why I'm doing that, because now in my equation, I have volume is equal to one-third pi, and instead of r, I'm going to introduce that three-fifths h. And this is still squared, and then times h. So now let's go ahead and simplify this. Volume is equal to one-third pi. This is going to be 9 over 25h squared times h. Let's simplify this a little more. One-third pi, 9 over 25h cubed 
And luckily for us, I can cancel out the three that's on the bottom, make that into a one, and the three on top is just gonna be a three. So now I have this equation. Volume is equal to three over 25 pi h cubed. Now we have a nice equation. <laughs> I've always been here. So now we have an equation involving only the volume and only the height. And that's great because, again, now we can go ahead and differentiate this and it, we're going to have a nice setup. Let me go ahead and take the derivative and then I'm going to make this uh, work a little smaller. So on the left side, the derivative of volume is 1. So we just include dv over dt. And on the right side, we have 9 over 25 pi h squared dh dt. Don't forget, I just did the power rule for the h. Pi is just a constant. Never assume that's going to be a variable. And then I include the dh dt. So let me go ahead and make this a little smaller. Whoops, whoops, whoops. There you go. Got to make sure I'm clicking on the right things. Hold on. Let, let's move this. Okay, here we go. Let me make this smaller. We are almost on the right track. Whoop. God, my mouse is, has been really sensitive lately. I don't know why. Okay, going back to this, now let's go ahead and plug in the things we know. We know dv dt, that's 1.6. So we have 1.6 equals 9 over 25 pi. The h, they told us the height was going to be 2. So that's just 2 squared times dh dt. That's actually what we're trying to find. Look at that. We, ha we didn't have to know anything about the radius except that it was proportional. You know, uh, user, I want to talk about that. They're saying, why can't you just plug in 3 for r and squares since r is a constant? Think about that, okay? Water is being poured into this cone. So initially, you have a really small radius. I'll even draw it out. In the diagram, you have this water or whatever liquid is being poured into the cone. And every single time you continue pouring, now my volume is getting larger. My radius is actually increasing. Okay, what the power rule was, going back to that problem, the way I did that is the power rule is all I did was take the 2 from the H, multiply it down. So I multiplied it to, uh, no, I'm sorry, that was the wrong one, wrong step over here. I got the 3, and I multiplied it down. So that's how I got 9 over 25. And then I subtract 1 from the power. That is the only uh, rule for the power rule. So user, I hope that makes sense why the radius can just be 3, because as the water level increases, the radius is increasing there. All right, so now let's go ahead and simplify this. We have 9 over 25 pi times 4 dh dt. So we have 1.6. Let me change the 1.6. Eh, no, I'll leave it like that for now. Is equal to 36 pi over 25 dh dt. As you can see, it's very important that you know how to just multiply fractions when it comes to calculus. A lot of people think that it's it's not important, but it actually is. Okay, now I'm going to multiply both sides by 25 over 36 pi. I'm just multiplying by the reciprocal. And so now I have this answer that my that the rate at which the height is changing or the water level is changing, dh dt is equal to 25 over 36 pi times 1.6. Let me just simplify this a little bit. Obviously, it's nice to have some calculators times 1.6. It's like 0. Oh, wow. It's actually really small. 0 0.3536. And this is uh, feet per meters per minute. All right. This is such an important problem to know because they love to trick you on something like this. And immediately you should identify, oh, there's nothing, there's nothing to do with the radius, so I need to somehow manipulate it and change it uh, using the height. Okay, so sometimes they'll give you the proportion. Sometimes they didn't really tell us that. They just said the diameter was 6 and the, the height was 5. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next problem. If you want to review this again, don't forget that I do have the replays on YouTube for you to watch. All right, let's go on to the next one. Ooh, this one's interesting. I don't know how many problems I have. This was seven out of, oh my gosh, nine. So we have three more problems. And then if we still have time, we'll definitely talk about some other stuff. All right, looking at this problem. So we have the aircraft is flying in an altitude of three kilometers at a speed of 60 kilometers per hour in a direction away from a tracking station. 
How far is the angle of elevation changing when the aircraft is over a point eight kilometers from the station? Ooh, this is really nice. So it's all about just creating the, uh, the diagram here. So let me just kind of create, I mean, we have to make it kind of fun. This is my satellite, boop. This is us tracking the that balloon out here. Okay, so let's see, we have the plane, it's an aircraft. Don't make fun of my drawings, guys. Just try my best here. Okay, here we go. So we know that it is at an altitude of three kilometers and it is going at a certain speed of 600 kilometers per hour. So that means, I don't know the distance here, x, but we know that dx dt, that's the horizontal distance that the aircraft is, doing, is making, is 600 kilometers per hour. And now we need to know, or we need to find how fast is the angle of elevation. So if I continue drawing this, whoa, not erase it. Okay, hold on. Gosh, I hate when Zoom does this. Like, doesn't identify what I'm trying to erase. Okay, now we're good. So if I go ahead and create, recreate my triangle here, we're trying to find this angle of elevation. We're trying to find the rate at which the angle of, ele of elevation is changing. So looking at this triangle, who can tell me in the comments what equation should we use that represents the three, the x, and the theta here? And I'll give you a clue. It's not Pythagorean identity. Let me know in the comments what you think. How do you know the units are going to be? Uh, based on the equation, they tell you kilometers per hour, and that's actually really good. When they're talking about volume, you know, it's kilometers uh, or like units cubed. If they talk about area, it's units squared. So you kind of have to remember, in this case, we're gonna, they're asking how fast is the angle changing, so we're going to do radians per hour. Okay, so it seems like <laughs> just go to business, not worth it. Tangent, someone said tangent. Juan, yes, thank you. Juan said tangent. That's exactly what we're going to use. If you recall, Sokatoa, tangent is the opposite over adjacent. So we're going to create a tangent theta over 3 over x. That's my opposite and that's my adjacent. But uh, yeah, I'm just going to leave it like this because now we're going to go ahead and take the derivative of this. On the left side, tangent theta is secant square theta times d theta dt. You always need to include the d theta dt because this is technically implicit differentiation. And on the left side, be very careful. This is going to be negative 3 over x squared dx dt. Let me show you why. I'm going to take the 3 over x and I rewrote it as 3x to the negative 1 because it's a rational function. And then I implemented the power rule by bringing the negative 1 down. So that became negative 3, x, and then I subtracted 1 from the power, which gave me negative 2. And so in return, this became negative 3 over x squared. And that's how I got that answer there. I didn't want to leave you guys in the dark there, so I just kind of wanted you to see how we got that. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure out what we do know. We don't know secant squared theta. We'll find that out. D theta is what we're actually trying to find, so that's okay that we don't know that. Let's see if we know the x value. Looking at the problem, they're saying how fast is the angle changing when the aircraft is 8 kilometers from the station. I'll highlight that on top. That's my x value because that's how far the plane is. So that's going to be negative 3 over 8 squared times dx dt. We know what that is. That's 600 because that is the rate of change of the aircraft. Let's simplify this a little bit, and then we're going to find our theta. So secant squared theta, d theta over dt, is equal to negative 1,800 over 64. As I make this a little smaller, go ahead and see how I did that math. Just think about it for a second. Okay, let's make this smaller. Okay, mouse, don't. There we go. Don't let me down. They didn't, thankfully. So now we need to find the theta. Well, going back to the problem, this is almost like uh, whenever you're trying to find the slope of a tangent line, you're given the x, but you need to find the y value. 
if I create a, the triangle here, I know my opposite is three. My x value was eight. So we need to find the theta, or better yet, we need to find the secant squared theta. Well, secant squared is the same thing as, uh, I guess we can do hypotenuse over adjacent. squared, but on the triangle, we don't have the hypotenuse, so we need to figure that out. We need to use Pythagorean theorem. Sometimes these just require a little more work than just plugging stuff in. So I'm just plugging this into a calculator program that I have for the TI-84, and we are going to find that missing angle. So this is root 73. So then secant squared is hypotenuse, root 73 over adjacent, which is 8 squared. That turns into 73 over 64. Yeah, that's not bad. And now we're going to go ahead and plug that in. That's my entire secant squared. So back to my problem, I have 73 over 64 d theta dt is equal to negative 1800 over 64. So let's multiply everything by 64 over 73. 64 over 73. Oh, this is kind of nice because now we get that d theta over dt is equal to, uh, this is interesting. I got, I'm going to get a negative angle. Oh, that makes sense. If you notice the 64s on the top and the bottom cancel out, so we're left with negative 1800 over 73. And we could just do rad per hour. Now, why is it negative? Well, that just means that because the plane is continuing to uh, move forward, that angle is technically going downward, so it's decreasing at a certain amount. This one was really interesting. These, these are always good. If you notice, I'm trying to give you a little bit of a, you know, variety here. We've been doing like volume of a cone, and then we did a triangle, and now we're doing a triangle here, but we're trying to find the rate of change of the theta. All right, let's go ahead and erase this and go on to the next one. Let's see, we got this one. Oh my goodness, is this really the last one? Oh, let me double check. Wow, this is the last one. And we're still going to have plenty of time. So start thinking about the things that you want to cover in terms of calculus, and then we'll definitely cover that. Just let me know in the comments. I'll stick around for like another 20 minutes after. So let's talk about this particular problem. A camera is mounted 4,000 feet from the base of a uh, launching pad and the rocket is rising at 1,000 feet per second. When it is 3,000 feet above the launching pad, how fast must the camera elevation angle change at that instant when the rocket uh, is in sight? And then there's another question. How fast is the camera rocket distance changing at that same moment? Eh, okay, so we'll do first the angle, and then we'll do the camera rocket distance. So let's go ahead and recre or create our problem here. So let's see, I have a nice little camera here. And then we have a rocket that's up here. I used to love drawing rocket ships when I was younger. I like to say I'm pretty good at it, but I don't know. Maybe not so much. Uh, I might need to change this a little bit because there's some weirdos on here. There you go. So this is the rocket here. We are creating this triangle. So let's see. The camera is mounted 4,000 feet from the base. So that's going to be the 4,000 feet. The rocket is rising vertically at 1,000 feet per second. So I can give this variable x because it's launching upward. And now we get dx over dt is equal to 1,000 feet per second. And now they're saying that find the theta. So find theta or d theta dt when x is equal to 3,000 feet because that's how far it is above the ground. So this is very much like the other problem where all we need to find is the relationship between this, and that's just tangent. Tangent is equal to x over 4,000, but this is much easier because, look, the x is on top. So when I take the derivative, I get secant squared theta d theta over dt equals just 1 over 4,000 times dx dt. 
So let's go ahead and figure out what's the stuff that we do know. We don't know secant squared. Let's just actually do that now. This is just like the previous problem. So if I draw my right triangle, 4,000 is up here, 3,000 is up here, and I'm going to very quickly say that my hypotenuse is 5,000. This is just a special right triangle. So secant, or secant squared theta, is equal to the hypotenuse over adjacent, so 5,000 over 4,000 squared. And this is just some basic math here, 25 over 16, that is my secant theta. So I can go ahead and plug that in to my equation that we have found. I have 25 over 16 times d theta dt equals 1 over 4,000 times just 1,000. So this is 25 over 6, whoops, I'm not going to do it like that. This is 25 over 16 d theta dt is equal to 1 fourth. Let me kind of move this because I know a lot of people can't see this with the comments. So let me just go ahead and change that up. Let me make this smaller. Oh, they don't want that. Let me erase. Yo, it's like Zoom isn't registering that again. Here we go. Let me make this a little smaller and then we'll finish off our problem. All right, so now we have 25 over 16 d theta over dt is equal to 1 fourth. We can go ahead and multiply both sides by 16 over 25. And now we have d theta dt is equal to 16 over 100. Whoops, I put a thousand there, which is just equal to 4 over 25. And we're going to put rad per. Uh, this is rad per, what was the, per second. Now, why is this positive? Well, that makes sense because the rocket is going upward, so obviously it's just going to start, it's, as it's shooting up, then, um, as it's shooting up, then the rating is going to be positive because it's moving in an upward direction, so yes, it is increasing at a um, positive rate. Dynamics homework. DXCT is a, is a thousand. Hold on, I'm just double checking. Someone said, Rusty, I'm trying to double. Oh, I think you were just trying, you were telling me. Improper integrals. So this was the last problem for related rates that I had. I didn't think I was going to get through them that fast. But again, if you're wanting to review this again, I do put the replay on YouTube for you to watch. So improper integrals, I mean, let's let's kind of do some examples here. Let me go ahead, I think I have, let me erase this real quick, or hold on. Okay, I'm going to close this off, and then we can do some improper integrals. Here is my whiteboard, which I'm going to share again. Here we go. My screen went away. All right, as so I'm trying to set this up, everyone talk amongst yourselves. What's going on? We kind of already know where each of us is from, but what are we doing? What's on the agenda? And to be honest, I lost. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Rusty. Always contributing. Minecraft with the family, that's awesome. To be honest, I've never played Minecraft, but I hear it's good. I have a lot of students that always play it. It's always fun. Uh, okay, so what kind of improper integrals can we do? Uh, let's see. Maybe I can I can pull up like a little worksheet or something. And by the way, I do have a Discord, so if people always have questions, you guys can join. That link is in my profile. And you guys are welcome to talk with a bunch of other math nerds that just are willing to talk about these methods. Okay, so let's see. What can we do with improper integrals? So what is an improper integral? That just means you have a function that's not defined, so we have to create some sort of limit for that. So let's just kind of talk, briefly talk about some, like a basic improper integral that we might have. I just pulled some up here. I just pulled a PDF. <laughs> Dynamics live. Oh, I wish. I wish. Uh, I don't even know if there's people out there that do that. If so, that's so cool. 
So this is a type of improper integrals that, uh, who was it, Mac and Ds said. So if we have an integral 1 to infinity, natural log of x over x squared. Okay, now why is this an improper integral? Whoops, let me just rewrite this a little better. Why is this an improper integral? Well, if we're trying to do the definite integral, I mean, we can easily start doing that where we uh, can integrate this, but you have that infinity. So we don't really know what that is. So technically what you have to do is you have uh, an equation where you're trying to find the area underneath the curve, but it never ends as you continue going towards infinity. So then what you, <laughs> you were just waiting for that. You were just waiting for that. Mm hmm. You were just waiting to say that. You kind of got me. Anyway, so as we have the infinity, we're going to go ahead and create a limit as b approaches infinity. And now we're going to have this set up 1 to b of natural log of x over x squared. Because now what we have is we are easily able to define and integrate this um this definite integral. So we just created a b on there. And so now we're gonna go ahead and integrate this. We're gonna use integration by parts. So we're gonna make our u equal to ln of x. That means our du is one over x, dx. Our dv is equal to, whoops, one over, uh, there we go, one over x squared dx. And then our v is gonna equal to negative one over x pretty simple. And now we're going to go ahead and use the ultraviolet voodoo to create our integral here. So we still have the limit as b approaches infinity of, we have negative 1 over x natural log of x plus integral of 1 over x squared dx. Not too bad, I would say. Not too bad at all. Okay, and we still have to integrate this. We have that last part. This is negative 1 over x, natural log of x, minus 1 over x. And then now we have our boundaries 1 to b. And we're going to go ahead and plug in the b, and then we're going to plug in the 1. So first, let's start with the b. So we have to plug in the b into every value of x that we have here. So we still have the limit as b approaches infinity of negative 1 over b, natural log of b. Actually, let me just rewrite this. This is negative natural log of b over b minus 1 over b. And then we have minus, and now we need to plug in the 1 into everything. So we have negative natural log of 1 over 1 minus 1 over 1. So let's go ahead and make this a little smaller. Then I'll talk about how some things uh, simplify. And then we're just going to break it down. All right. Whoops. Here we go. All right. Not too bad. So just as I rewrite this, I have the ne negative uh, natural log of b over b minus 1 over b. And then in the parentheses, I'm going to distribute the negative to the first part. But look that I have a natural log of 1. That just cancels out. That goes away. And then I'm going to distribute it to the other one, the other value that we have here. And that's just the plus 1. Okay, so now we technically have to take the, the integral, or not the integral, the limit of everything here. Okay, so when I take the limit of the part in the middle, that's just going to be zero because negative one over infinity is just zero. So I can, I don't have to worry about that. The one at the very end, that's just one. All I need to do now is just worry about that first term. The limit as b approaches infinity of negative b, negative natural log of b over b. If I were to use substitution, I would get a negative natural log of infinity over infinity which is infinity over infinity, which is great because now we can go ahead and use L'Hopital's rule. So that gives me limit as negative or as B approaches infinity of negative one over B over one. So I took the derivative of the top and derivative of the bottom. And so now I just have negative one over infinity, which is equal to zero. So at the end, my answer is just going to be zero plus zero plus one. The first term or that first limit that we found just now was zero plus the middle term, which we said was going to equal to zero and then plus one. So then this limit is equal to one. So the area underneath the curve starting from one as it approaches or it goes on forever in the x-axis is just going to be one. 
sometimes it's very uneventful. We do these problems and it en just ends up being uh, something like one or it just doesn't exist. All right, here's a fun one for you guys. This might be an integral that you guys recognize, but then you're going to see that the parameters are going to make things a little difficult for us. Let me just go ahead and erase this. All right. I'm just checking the time on my end. Okay, so how about this one, guys? Limit or the integral from negative infinity to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. Looking at this, let me know in the comments, what do you think this is equal to? or the integral so far, but we can't uh, set it up just yet. We have to do something with this. It's definitely going to be an arc tan. Thank you, Mac and I'm just going to say Mac and D. I'm just going to call you McDonald's. Yes, thank you, <laughs> ALX, Arctan. That's exactly what it's going to be. But look at the parameters. We have it from negative infinity to infinity, so we can't really do that just yet. So then what we need to do is we need to create two integrals here. One from negative infinity to zero of one over one plus x squared dx plus zero to, ne or zero to positive infinity of one over one plus x squared dx. So that helps me break it down because now at least I have one value in uh, one of the, the parameters. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and take the limit or start a limit problem for each definite integral. So I have limit as B approaches negative, well, let's do A for this one, as A approaches negative infinity from A to zero of one over one plus X squared DX plus the limit as B approaches infinity from zero to B of one over one plus X squared. And then now I think a lot of people had already told us Yes, I let negative infinity is equal to a, yeah, mm -hmm. I know, calc 2, so fun, right? So now that we have these limits, you guys already said, someone had said that this is just going to be an arctan. That's something that we can talk about later on. Maybe next Thursday I'll do like some trig sub, uh, trig sub integrals. That's all we'll worry about on next Thursday's live. And now what we have is the limit as A approaches negative infinity of arctan of x from A to 0 plus the limit as B approaches infinity of R tan of X from zero to B. And now we're just going to go ahead and implement the first fundamental theorem. So we have R tan of zero minus, let me just go ahead and still put my limit there. Whoops. Limit A approaches negative infinity. R tan of zero minus R tan of A And then we have plus the limit as B approaches infinity of arctan of B minus arctan of zero. Okay, before we even continue, who can tell me what arctan of zero is? Because that's exactly what we have on both of these. Arctan of zero, drop it in the comments if you know what arctan of zero is going to be. This is the angle where the tangent is equal to zero. And I'll give you a hint. It's already there. It's zero. Yes, Andy. Nice job. Arctan of zero is just going to be zero. So now we can go ahead and cancel those things out. So we just have the limit as A approaches negative infinity of negative arctan of A plus the limit as B approaches infinity of arc 10 of B. And here's the tough part. We kind of have to know what this is. If you use direct substitution, we have negative arc 10 of negative infinity plus arc 10 of positive infinity. And this is why um, we should definitely know how arc 10 looks like, especially like in Calc 2. This uh, looks like a function. And arctan, arctan is just a very basic one. I'll kind of draw it up on top. I believe arctan goes like this. And it has asymptotes. And negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So just kind of looking at the graph. As A approaches negative infinity, so as we go all the way to the left, that's negative pi over 2. And as uh, arctan approaches infinity, as we go to the right, that's just positive pi over 2. 
So then our answer, oh, I hope it fits. Let me actually move this just so everyone can see it if the comments are blocking the way here. Let me go ahead and make this a little smaller. Oh, geez. There we go. That doesn't really help. So sensitive. So Zoom's got to do something about this. Okay, so as I mentioned, negative, uh, the arc ten of negative infinity is just negative pi over 2. So this is negative, negative pi over 2, plus positive pi over 2. So we have pi over 2 plus pi over 2, and this is just equal to pi. So it's possible to find these improper integrals. They just take some time. How about that, huh? Okay, this is another interesting one. Oh, this is the one where a lot of people can, ooh, 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 ooh. I, uh, what should we, ooh, check this one out. This is actually kind of fun, and we can talk about what, ha oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this will be our last problem. Really excited about this one, because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the, um, we're going to kind of do the P series, and then we're going to show how we can do that for a uh, improper integral. McDonald's, what's your test on tomorrow? Is it on this? All right, guys. So this is the summation trick sub to this. Okay. Listen, my, my advice is just continue practicing. The only way you're going to get better is just literally pull out a piece of paper, a pencil, or a pen, and just write stuff down and practice as many problems as you can. And, of course, you know, watching these, I think, help. Just seeing people solve different problems can really help uh, in just, like, digesting it in your brain. Okay, so we have a summation from 1 over x of p. This is a uh, p series. And if you guys don't remember this, there's a rule that if P is equal to 1, then the sum is going to diverge. So this sum will equal to uh, this sum will equal to infinity. If it is not equal to 1, and really if it's, uh, I believe it's greater than or equal to 1 or something like that. If it's not equal to 1, it's going to converge. But we're going to talk about how that's the case. The way we're going to do this is we're going to do integral test. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the limit from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx. So first, let's just make p is equal to 1. So we have the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the power of 1, which is going to be really easy because hopefully you guys recognize that. And of course, we have to create the limit. So we have to do the limit as b approaches infinity from 1 to b of 1 over x dx. And when I take this limit, or when I take the integral, not the limit yet, that is going to be natural log. So we have the limit as b approaches infinity of natural log absolute value of x from 1 to b. So then this becomes the limit as b approaches infinity of natural log absolute value of b minus natural log absolute value of 1. As you can already tell, natural log of 1 is just 0, so we don't have to worry about that. So really, we're just trying to find the limit as b approaches infinity natural log of b, meaning that this is natural log of infinity. And that's just infinity, as we had said. So yes, by integral test, this diverges. And now let's go ahead and try it where p is not equal to 1, which is going to be a little trickier just because it's going to be more variables. But let me just erase this. And then we will go ahead and finish off our last problem for the day. And then tomorrow, around the same time, we're going to do off trail. So I don't know what the topic is going to be, but we'll do something crazy. Typically, that's how it is on Fridays. Tuesdays is integration B. Thursdays is math survival skills. So if you guys have any uh, requests, let me know in the comments. Join the Discord. Let me know. And then Fridays are just going to be off trail. So anything, anything goes. So now let's say that P does not equal to 1. So we have the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the P dx. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to obviously write my limit from 1 to b. And then I'm going to write this as x to the negative p dx. Because I have a rational function, I just want to bring it on top. And now I'm going to go ahead and implement the power rule. So we have the limit as b approaches infinity of x to the negative p plus 1 over negative p plus 1. 
from 1 to b. And now let's go ahead and plug in the b and the 1. So we have the limit as b approaches infinity of b to the negative p plus 1 over negative p plus 1 minus 1 to the negative b plus 1 or p plus 1 over negative p plus 1. This is a little interesting, just the way it looks. Okay? So let me just kind of rewrite this a little bit. Because these are both these both have the same denominator. So then what I'm going to do is on, I'm going to pull out the denominator, but then I'm going to write it as 1 over 1 minus p times, and then I have uh, what I have now is 1 over b to the p minus 1. So think about how I did that. Okay, I got this. I'm going to circle that there. I got that b to the negative p plus 1, and I brought it down. So the p became positive, and then the 1 just became a minus 1. And then now I have minus. Technically, this is just 1. Okay, the p doesn't really, well, I guess the p could matter in here. Um, this is just in terms of b, oh, and I guess I have to write my limit, so let me just kind of fit it on here. The limit as b approaches infinity. Okay. So here's the thing. If I plug in infinity into the b, which is the only term here, then I have 1 1 over 1 minus p times 1 over infinity to the p minus 1 minus 1. Now here's the thing. We already talked about p was if p was equal to 1, we know that diverges, but if p was greater than 1, then that means that this denominator, it's a little tricky to kind of understand, but if p was greater than 1, then that denominator uh, is going to have infinity to like some positive uh, some positive exponent. So that's just going to be 1 over infinity, which is just going to be 0. So again, if p was greater than 1, then this just becomes 1 over 1 minus p times 0 minus 1. And that just becomes negative 1 over 1 minus p. And I think this is, uh, this is the same thing as geometric uh, series. But if p was less than 1, let me just actually make this a little smaller because I think it's worth looking at. Uh, there we go. So if p was less than 1, p was less than 1, then I would have 1 over 1 over 1 minus p times 1 over, let's just keep that infinity there, infinity to the p minus 1 minus 1. Now if p was less than 1, then that would mean that this exponent will be negative. Just think of an example. If it was 1 half, 1 half minus 1, that's just going to be negative 1 half. So you're going to have a negative exponent. And what's going to happen with the negative exponent, we're just going to use the properties of exponents. That is going to go on top. So we're basically going to have an infinity minus 1, and that's just going to be infinity. So that's why we have to be very careful, and that's the integral test. So if p was equal to 1, it diverges. If p was less than 1, it also diverges. But if p is greater than 1, then it's equal to negative 1 over 1 minus p. That is the p-series test. So that's kind of cool how you can relate the p-series test to um, improper integrals. Let me just read this last comment here. So if infinity is being divided, it's more likely to be 0. And if multiplied, yes. Technically, yes. But obviously, don't just see like, oh, it's if, if it's under infinity, then it's going to be, um, then it's automatically going to be 0. But in this case, I think because we were being a little more, um, more technical. I kind of want to just mention that why that's the case. Let me just erase this real quick. Oh, it's not, there we go. If we have 1 over infinity... Think of it like you're trying to divide one pizza. We use L'Hopital's whenever we have infinity over infinity. So there's actually, I believe, six different cases. Infinity over infinity, zero over zero, uh, zero or zero to the power, infinity to the power infinity. I always forget the, all six, but there's six different methods. So if you look it up, like conditions for L'Hopital's, you'll be able to find it. But I just want to mention here, one over infinity is equal to zero. 
The reason being, one way to really look at it is think of it like you're trying to divide one pizza amongst infinitely many people. So that's everyone in the world, everyone in the universe, everyone in the uh, gosh, in, if there were multiple universes, so everyone. So you have one pizza divided by infinitely many people, then basically everyone's going to get no pizza whatsoever. But if we have infinity over one, or even infinity over a hundred, let's just say, for example, in this case, infinity is on top, you have infinitely many pizzas in the world, infinitely many pizzas that you're dividing amongst a hundred people, you're, you're going to bet that a lot of people or every single person there is going to get a lot of pizza. So that's why it's equal to infinity. I always like to think of it that way. I think it's worth uh, exploring it in different um, ideas, but that's the way I like to think of it. So anytime infinity is on the bottom, if you have a really large number in the denominator, it's zero. If you have a really large number on top, it's going to be infinity. Anyway, guys, that is all I have for today. Perfect timing, too. So just so you know, uh, tomorrow, off trail, anything goes, we're probably going to do some integrals, maybe some derivatives, and we'll for sure have more people on here. Typically, Thursdays are very intense and very, um, I wouldn't even say broad, like very specific skills. So there's a reason why there's not many people on here. But on Tuesdays and Fridays, it gets crazy. So be on the lookout for that. In the meantime, please follow me here on TikTok, follow me on Instagram, follow me on YouTube, join the Discord. Everything is on the link in my profile. And until then, I hope you guys have a fabulous Thursday. I'm going to see you guys tomorrow or the next week. Um, we'll see. All right. Until then, take it easy.